Hello everybody. Um, in the last video, I did a little bit of a recap of what a differential equation even is uh, for those of you who either don't remember or never took a differential equations course, and that's cool. Um, we don't need differential equation solution techniques from those courses in any case, because all we're going to be doing is doing uh, numerical solutions, kind of approximating um, what the solution to an initial value problem is as time progresses. And we're going to cover a few different techniques. Uh, the first is going to be really, really simple and straightforward, but they're going to escalate from there. So I want you to make sure that you understand this one really well uh, before we take it and go crazy with it. So as I said, Euler's method, or if you're a non-refined, Euler's method, but don't say that because I'll get mad at you. Um, it's a simple method for approximating the solutions to a first order initial value problem. So suppose you're given a first order initial value initial value problem. So y prime equals some function of t and y. So you have some, some t and y terms on the right hand side, and you can arrange it in this way. So you just have y prime equals that stuff. And we have some sort of initial condition that says y at some starting time is some starting y. So the t0 and the y0 are just constants. We talked about how the solution to this differential equation has an infinite number of solution curves that kind of fill up um, the solution space. So like there are a whole bunch of curves, an infinite number of them. And what that initial condition does, this right here, whatever this looks like, y of zero equals one, y of two equals e, it doesn't really matter. That initial condition picks out one of those solution curves and that's the one, that's the one that um, we might be interested in approximating here. Okay, f is assumed to be continuous uh, just so that uh, it's kind of the processes we make that we talked about here makes some sense. And it's pretty straightforward. Here's how it works. You start with the point defined by the initial condition. We know that that has to lay on the curve, right? Because that initial condition, the solution to the initial value problem has to go through it. So we're going to start with that point. And what we're going to do is consider a step size of h going forward in the direction of increasing t. So we're going to step forward in time uh, by t. And what we'll do is we'll use the tangent line, the tangent line to the solution at the initial point, t0, y0. So I'm going to find, um, not I don't know what the solution is itself. I don't need it either. But if I can find the tangent to that solution, that tangent's going to provide, well, kind of a first degree approximation to what the solution is. Uh, if you think about like, you know, the background of Taylor or whatever. And I can take that and walk along that tangent line a certain amount of time, uh, a step size of h, and that's what we're going to do. That way we're going to get an estimate of the height of the solution function that much forward in time. So the next time is going to be t0 plus h. The point we arrive at is going to be t1, y1. Now t1, y1 may or may not be, usually won't be, on the curve that we're interested in. But if the step size is small, then it's going to be pretty close to the correct solution curve. And remember when I said that the general solution to the differential equation fills up the whole solution space with an infinite number of solutions. So that means that at this new point, t1, y1, there's going to be another solution that passes through that. And we're going to use the tangent of that solution to keep going forward. Uh, it might lead us to not exactly the same place, and there's going to be some error involved. But I want to show you graphically what this looks like. Um, so that's what's on this page. The procedure, you can repeat it as many times as you desire, and you step forward in time by that step size every single time. So you produce a sequence of estimates rather than a continuous function. So the true differential equation might have a, um, a solution function that's some continuous function. But what we get is the sequence of estimates that kind of step forward in time. The t values that we land on are sometimes called mesh points. I won't necessarily use that term that often, but you may see that in the future, so you should know and are separated by the step size h. And we should keep that step size reasonably small to reduce the error that is involved in this method because it does tend to pile up over time. Okay, this process is called the numerical solution of initial value problems. So check this out. This is, what's, uh, this is kind of what it looks like, and I've tried to, to draw it out as nicely as possible. So we have a solution curve. This is the true curve right here this phi of t that I've drawn. 
And these red points are our estimates. And you can see that we start the, the first estimate is on the initial condition. Our first estimate is 100% accurate. We're, we're sure of that. And what we do is we take the tangent to the solution curve because we don't know what the solution curve is. We don't have a function to work with. We only have the differential equation. I'm going to use that tangent, um, that tangent uh, slope, step forward in time by a step size of h. Here, h equals 1, so it's pretty big. Uh, and the point that we get to, boom, is going to be um, our x1 and our, our t1, x1. And then what we do is we find the solution that would pass through here. Notice the green arrows in the background are what's called the direction field. It's kind of telling us the uh, direction in which solutions point at any at, at any uh, point in that uh, solution space. So um, essentially the tangent at that point is this line right here. And we're gonna step, that was a really wiggly line, so I'll get rid of that. But we step forward in time that far to get to x2, and we repeat the process, repeat the process, repeat the process, and so on. And you can see that the different um, um, values along the way do get further and further from the true value. Um, but maybe if we kept that step size pretty small, we can do pretty well as well, okay? So all we need to do, if we understand what this looks like, the, the question mark is, how do I find the tangent line to the solution? But in fact, it's staring you in the face, and that's kind of what the cool thing is about this method. So, right, so keeping the picture in the map, last page in mind, we want to be able to find T1, Y1 if we're given an initial condition, T0, Y0, and the DE, the DE describes everything. The DE is dy by dt equals a function of t and y. Our job is to walk along the tangent line to the curve, passing through that initial condition until we've moved forward in t by our step size h. So our goal is basically to, sit, to, to say how far up or down does our y move, right? How much does y change as we move from t0 to t0 plus h, t0 plus that step size? Does y move up, down, how much? What's our best estimate for how much y goes up or down? And of course, it depends on how steep the tangent line is, right? If it's very steep, then y is going to increase by a lot. If it's very steep negative, it's going to decrease by a lot. If it doesn't change much, if the tangent is close to zero, y probably isn't going to change all that much. The answer completely depends on the tangent slope, but the tangent slope is given by the quantity dy by dt. And dy by dt is given by f of t and y. I can literally plug in t0, y0 into the right-hand side of that and know exactly what the tangent slope should be because it tells me, the differential equation literally tells me dy by dt is a f of t and y. If I plug in t0, y0, I get dy dt equals whatever that is at that point, at the, at the point, t0, y0. That's what the slope is. So yeah, dy by dt evaluated at t0, y0 is nothing more than, well, f of t0, y0. All right, and then we just have to think about what slope is, right? dy by dt is the tangent slope. I know that slope is rise over run. And if I'm thinking about the, you know, change in y one way or the other, I want to know what the rise is. The run is nothing more than our step size forward, right? Our, 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 our h, which is the amount between each one of those uh, estimates and so on. That's what the run is equal to, is h. So we can easily figure out the rise or the change in y over the interval, right? If you take a look at slope equals rise over run, and I know that slope is going to be dy by dt, which was f of t0, y0, and we know that the run is h, then the rise is going to be given by, if I multiply up by that h, h is non-zero, I get h times f of t0, y0, just like that. That's just me multiplying up by that run on both sides. And this is giving me the change in y. So what I'm going to want to do is take that quantity, h times f of t0, y0, 
add it to the old y value, and that's going to give me the new y value. Right? And you can see it, it kind of makes some sense. The two quantities, this is the slope, this is the h. The larger h is, the more it's going to have a chance to go up and down, so it's going to be larger in magnitude. And the larger the f is, the larger the, the slope is, the larger the quantity is going to be because you're just going up faster for every unit of, um, of t, right? So it, it the formula makes a lot of sense. So here's what we get. Here's what the scheme is. And this is what I would like you to know how to use. t1, y1, t next, y next, if you will. It's going to be t0 plus h, so one step forward in time from the, from the initial condition. And then take your y0, your original y, and add that quantity that we found, h f of t0, y0. And then we repeat the process. We do it as many times as you want. And in general, this is what we get. t next, y next, i plus 1, y i plus 1, is equal to t the previous one plus h, and take the previous y, and add h times f of t i y i. So it's, it's not very hard at all. Um, and we're going to do a couple of examples to showcase it. So um, example one, we're going to work with this in a couple different ways. Uh, we want to see the error attached to, to using the process as well. So this is going to explore both of those. Okay, so we have y prime equals y uh, plus sine of pi t. So this here is our f of t and y. This here, y of zero equals one is our initial condition. So we know immediately that t0 equals 0, y0 equals 1. So we have our initial t, we have our initial y. We have our function, f of t and y. And we can use Euler's method to estimate the value of the solution at later values. And in this problem, it's saying use a step size of 1. So we want h equals 1 here. And we want to estimate the value of the solution at t equals 2. So t0 is 1, or sorry, sorry, t0 is 0, and for the step size of 1, that means that I need to iterate twice, right? I need to go forward in time by 1, and then forward in time once again. So we'll need two iterations to get to t equals 2. So we'll need to iterate twice to get an estimate at t equals 2. Okay, so let's do it. Let's do it. What do we have here? At the start, we have t0 equals 0, y0 equals 1. I'm going to try to be organized here, and this is how it's going to work. y1 is equal to, and it was y old, y0, plus, and it was h times f of t0, y0. Okay, what is the f? Well, we've got it right here. And I just want to make sure that I got this right. I think we're good to go. So let's sub in some stuff. Y1 is going to equal the old Y, which was 1, plus H, which was 1, and then F of T0, Y0. So F of 0 and 1. So I think that's going to be uh, carefully subbing things in. Uh, the Y will be 1 plus sine of pi times uh, t right now is 0. So this is what we've got. y1 is going to be this. And if we work that out, well, sine of 0 is 0, so that's gone. And I get 1 plus 1, that's 2. Um, yeah. Yeah, that works out. That's what I got. So my y1 is equal to 2. I'm going to put a little box around that. And we've completed one iteration, just like that. Once we go forward in time by one time step, so to, we're now at t equals 1, because that's what the h was, h was 1, we're now at t1 equals 1, and from that last iteration, we know that y1 is equal to 2. And then we can do that again to make an estimate of what's happening at t equals 2. Okay, so y2 will equal y1 plus h times f of t1 y1, and if you plug that in, we get y2 equals, and then y1, y1 is 2. The h is still 1. We need to plug in for t1 is 1, y1 is 2, and I need to put that into the function. So it's going to be a 2 plus uh, sine of pi. 
pi times 1. Just like that. Sine of pi is 0, so that's gone again. And we get 2 plus 2 is 4. And this is what we end up with. So that is our estimate. This is our estimate of the solution. <clears throat> the solution height at t equals 2. Okay, so this, this uh, method, using a step size of 1, will estimate the, the height of the solution that starts at, um, what, 0, 1. And it's, it's predicting that it's going to go through the point 2, 4. Well, okay, so here's the, here's the, the second problem. Um, part B here, I actually give you the solution. I'm never going to ask you to solve a differential equation, okay? Um, like algebraically using techniques from, from the differential equations class or anything like that. That's not the point here. But I could give you a true solution and get you to compare. The true solution to this initial value problem, y prime equals y plus sine of pi t, is this. So this is what the actual solution is if you were to solve the differential equation and apply the initial condition. And the question is, what is the absolute and relative error in our approximation from part A? Okay, so that means we need to compare our estimate with the true value of y at 2. So we must compare our estimate of y equals 4 with the true value. Um, Evaluate it at uh, t equals 2. And the true value, of course, is just given by, just given by, this function. So what we'll do is, is just take a second to do that. So the true. The true is given by y of 2. So we're going to unfortunately plug in um, a 2 here and see where that takes us. We get e squared plus, uh, it's going to be so gross, I'm so sorry, pi e squared minus pi cos of 2 pi minus the sine of two pi. And this second term is all over pi squared plus one. Okay, that's really yucky, but I kind of worked it out in advance. Um, I think that this turns out to be eh, approximately equal to 9.236, if you work that out in a calculator or whatever. So 9.236, this is the true, this is our estimate up here. Pretty crappy, it looks like, but we can calculate error. And we'll talk a little bit about why the error is very high. Um, and that's ultimately going to lead to a, a couple of different conversations we'll have, but just hang on to that. Um, so, absolute error is going to equal the absolute value of the true minus the estimate. So it's about 5.236. And, of course, the relative error is going to put that over that 9.236. So 9.236 minus 4 over 9.236. If you work that out, you end up with a rather unattractive looking uh, approximately 56.7% error. Not the best. Not the best, but that's what this is. That's what the parameters of the problem led us to. And uh, that's just where we're at. Okay, so we have a, a method. Seemed good in practice. Seemed fine to like draw pictures and so on and, and get there. But it looks like the results aren't great. But that's that's all right. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. All right, let's uh, turn the page and see what's on the next uh, question. Ah! Excellent. Nothing like doing another example from the start. And uh, I always feel like sometimes it's really tedious to repeat um, some of these calculations by hand. That's partly to inspire you to recognize the value of going to MATLAB and, and programming it to do these ugly uh, steps for you. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, at the end here. Um, but also, I think that you just learn the scheme well when it becomes boring, you know? So kind of just bear with me here. 
Repeat the previous example, except this time using a step size of h equals 0 0.5. Okay, so um, here's kind of the parameters. Uh, let's remind ourselves of what the function is. So our f of t and y was, what was it? y plus sine of pi t, y plus sine of pi t, yep. So y plus the sine of pi times t, uh, we had t0 equals 0 and y0 equals 1. And I'll just double check that to make sure I don't go astray. But it looks like we're pretty good. And all that we're doing here is changing it so that the step size is smaller. So we're dealing with the step size of 0 0.5 instead of 1. So we're having the step size. We're taking smaller steps. And hopefully, we aren't going to go as far off the true curve that way. And we're going to find the absolute and relative error in the approximation again at t equals 2. So because we have to go all the way to t equals 2, this time we're going to need four iterations because each step is only going to bring us half a step forward, like 0.5 forward. So a first iteration will bring us to t equals 0 0.5, another one to 1, a third to 1.5, a fourth will bring us to 2. So we need four iterations. Four iterations with h equals 0 0.5 to get here. Okay, so we're going to be a little bit bored here, but that's okay. Um, we'll learn the method really well that way. So at the start, at the start, we have t0 equals 0, y0 equals 1, and the scheme says y1 is going to equal the old y plus um, our h is 0 0.5, plus, uh, oh, not plus, times f of t0, y0. That's going to be f of 0 and 1. Maybe I'll just uh, put these in and I'll just label them kind of. So y0 was 1. So this here is, I'm just going to label them. This is y0, this is h, this is uh, f of t0, y0, just like that. So we've got these things right here. And uh, I can sub in for that f of 0 and 1 and figure out what that is. So we get 1 plus 0 0.5. Um, yeah, uh, we had y is 1 plus sine of pi times 0 right here. Sine of 0, 0 still. And we end up with 1.5. Okay. That gives me what y1 is. We know that we're taking half steps forward. So 0 0.5 is my next, oh, not t0. Now it's going to be t1. t1 is 0 0.5. y1 is 1.5 now. And we're going to work on finding y2. y2 will equal the old y plus the step size times f of t1, y1. So we're going to get, uh, maybe I'll give myself another line just to keep things from getting crammed into the side of the page. Um, and we get f of, this is going to be 1.5 plus sine of, uh, let's see here, 0 0.5 pi. Like that. Uh, sine of 0 0.5 pi is sine of pi over 2. This here is 1. And so if you work this all out, we get 1.5 plus 1 is 2.5. Half of that is 1.25. I add that to 1.5. A buck 50 plus a dollar and a quarter is 275. So that's my next estimate. Just want to make sure that matches. And it does. So we're good. That's my y2. We have to do this two more times. So you see, it's really not that hard, but it is just annoying. The next t is t equals 1. My next y is what we just found. And we're going to find y3. y3 will equal the previous y plus the h times f of, um, yeah, f of t2, y2. So it's 2.75 plus 0 0.5 times, and then y plus sine of pi times t, so 1 times pi. I think this looks good. Um, yeah, sine of pi is 0, so this is gone. 2.75, what's half of 275? 
I'm adding that to 2.75. This is getting a little bit tougher to do, but it's, I think it's 4.125, yeah. That's gonna be our third estimate. You can already see that this estimate at the end is going to be higher than uh, what we got for the last time. Our T3 is 1.5, our Y3 is 4.125. We have one more to go. And Y4 is going to equal the last Y that we found, plus 0 0.5, and then 4.125 plus the sine of um, 1.5 pi, which is 3 pi over 2, which is going to be minus 1. And if you work this one out, um, again, it's getting a little bit tough to do this in your head. This is 5.6875 like this. All right, cool. So that is our, this is our final estimate. We're still quite a ways off, right? Um, the true value again was nine point something, 9.236. We're closer for sure. It does better than we had, than we were before. And you can actually show that the error is going to decrease to zero as that step size gets arbitrarily small. Um, but it looks like we're undershooting a lot, and that could be just due to the nature of the functions that are involved. Um, but we can calculate the error and so on. So the absolute error is now, well, it's approximate because I've done some rounding with that true value. So it's now uh, 9.236 minus 5.6875. Just as long as you give me a few decimal places, I'll usually specify you know, three or four on a test, you'll be fine. I'm pretty easy going with regards to this stuff. 3.5845 or so, and the relative error. Relative error, which is going to be the same quantity, but divided by the true. Um, yeah, divided by the true. I guess I could just write this outside the absolute values. This is positive anyway. It doesn't really matter. Um, but in case somebody asks me a question, I'll write it properly like this. And that works out to about 38.4% per now. So, you know, like it's not great. We're still off by a substantial, a substantial margin, but it's improved in its quality. It's improved in its quality and you know, if you were to iterate, say, 20 times with a step size of 0 0.1, you would find that the error uh, substantially reduces as well. So, yeah, uh, uh, an aim when using this method is to make sure that h is as small as possible, because then you just tend to hug the curve a little bit more closely. And, uh, you know, as long as your computer can handle that small step size, doing a whole bunch of iterations becomes a little bit more practical. That being said, we're going to talk a little bit more about some better methods that have substantially less error. And it's kind of amazing because um, some of those methods are very novel, like really creative. And um, if you have a good appreciation for what's going on with those direction fields and what this scheme is doing, those methods should make a lot of sense. But that's for a couple of lectures from now. Okay, um, before the end here, I want to talk a little bit about coding this method. Um, we don't have a big uh, sort of uh, section here because it's not terribly hard to do. Plus, I want to leave you to wrestle with it a little bit, um, uh, perhaps for homework or perhaps for a lab. Not really sure because I don't have your lab finished yet. But uh, let's see. After doing a couple of examples by hand, it should be fairly obvious that this is a method that is well handled by a computer. So I'm going to list the ingredients for Euler's method but I'll leave it for you to kind of figure out how it comes together in, in a loop in some code. It doesn't take more than a few lines, which is pretty cool. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is initialize the problem. We have to define the DE. If we're restricted to first order DEs, like the ones we've been talking about, you really just need the right-hand side of the DE, which defines what that slope is doing, okay? We also need the initial condition, so, right? some value for t0, some value for y0, defined at the top of the code, and some value for h. 
Okay, those are the th different parameters that govern this process. So this process, as we know, is going to require a loop uh, if we want to do it again and again and again. And um, yeah, I guess it, unless you have a special need to, there's no real reason to store every approximation on the way. You know, like I don't need the whole sequence. I can kind of redefine um, our initial y and t every single pass through the loop. So that means, you know, you pass through once and you can have a, a line that says like, t is equal to t plus h, something like that, because that's going to redefine your current t value um, as, uh, you'll probably want, if you have t as a symbolic variable, you'll probably want to write something like t0 equals t0 plus h, something like this, um, to redefine where you're at right now um, as like a new initial point that you're then going to extend from and get another estimate and so on. And in that way, you're continually evolving forward in time. Um, without having to store a whole array of different variables. You could, on the other hand, store a whole vector of um, of estimates at every time point along the way, which is kind of a cool idea as well. But um, So you have a couple of different options here. Um, yeah, and then repeat the process until you perform a specified number of iterations or you get to a desired value of t. So really, you have some stuff at the top of the code that defines the problem, you have a main loop with literally one or two lines max in the middle that iterates the process, updates your values of y and t, and you just keep doing it. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully not too, too bad. I've included a flow chart here. That way maybe you can take this and translate it into code. And if you can do that, it feels really powerful. One good way that you can test is to take this example that we talked about in lecture and try to make code that does it. And if you can get the same errors that we got and calculated here, then you'll know that you did it right. Uh, and one cool thing is that you could um, play with the, you know, the step size h, for example, and um, see what happens when you tinker with it, when you make it really, really small and see the error decrease before your eyes without having to do 20 iterations by hand. It's really cool. Um, so yeah, this is going to go through and you can see it's a pretty simple process. Um, here's the definitions. Okay. I said I used current T and current Y for the variable names. So you can do whatever you want. Um, and you find the estimate for the next value via the scheme, right? This is what the scheme is. You update the value of the current T which is what I mentioned on the last page there. You just need to make sure that you're up to date with the current value of T. And then have you reached the desired value of T yet? Yes or no. If you haven't, you just go and repeat the process. It's super straightforward. And as I said, one or two lines of code in the middle of that loop will, will do it. At the end of the day, you get your final approximation here. And we could then um, calculate error, etc. If we happen to know, if we had access to the true solution. Now, one reason that we might use a method like this is because we don't have the true solution and we need an estimate. But it's kind of nice if we try this method on some simpler problems first, so we kind of get a feel for what the parameters would have to be. Um, how do we... Uh, uh, gain a little bit of confidence that the method that we're using can be pretty accurate. What should the H be in terms of its its magnitude in order to work with this? So it's nice to have problems where we have the solutions and we have one here in the notes. Um, so just, just play with it. Try to put this together um, for some homework. And uh, I think it's pretty satisfying to do. That being said, let's bring this in. Let's bring this in. Um, it's pretty clear that the method comes with some issues, though. I mean, we talked about 56% error or something like that. And then we reduced the um, the number of steps uh, or the step size in half, and we still had a substantial amount of error. Euler's method has problems. It's good conceptually to kind of understand uh, what's going on with these numerical solutions to differential equations. But let me tell you that in practice, nobody uses this scheme. 
Um, there are better methods that we can talk about, and that's what we're going to um, get to next. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, what are called runge kata methods, and uh, that sounds scary, but it's really just a couple of people's names. Um, they are more complicated, so you'll want to really understand what this stuff is doing first. And I have the greatest confidence that you will talk to me and uh, let me know if you're having any problems with that. Okay, so um, that's all for now. And as always, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. And um, I'll see you in the next lecture. Bye, everybody.